and we're clear. We are rolling, folks. Welcome back to the Monday Morning Cup Show. A little special edition Thursday night episode coming out of the Mets series, looking ahead into the Brewers series. But first things first, guys, obviously, this is Carl. This is Mahoney. We're doing a remote here, guys. We're squeezing this one in. Some banter before the show. I asked him, is is this an emergency podcast? We call I, it emergency. It more of an urgency podcast. It's necessary and it's needed. I want a level set. How about we say necessary, urgent podcast? This is something I think everybody needs. Selfishly, you and I need this. We need I'll this for sign. the next Monday show. We need it for everything. The, the chat is flying. The team is unbelievable. We're going to get into a quick state of the union. We're going to look at the Mets series. I want to preview a little stuff with the Brewers. I want to dig in on some of these topics that's all through the fan base. How's that sound? That sounds great, dude. Let's just start off the top. I want you to give it to me. Start state of the union. Where do you got, dude? Like, Let's get into it. Record division. Let's go. Rattle it off, Carl. Yep. I'm going to give you guys a state of the union. I'm also going to say this. Mahoney's fucking prep for this show, boys. We I'm are, ready we, to rock. When I, yeah. When I said we are rolling off the top, I'll guarantee we got a 30-minute, like I said, urgent, necessary podcast here. We're going to keep this thing nice and tight. The ball is rolling on Monday, so that's why we say we're rolling. I just want to add a little bit sauce to it. I don't know if this is going to be an every Thursday thing, but like I said, Cubs are playing really good baseball and really bad baseball at the same time. It's a super interesting moment. So that's kind of the theme as we come into the show. And again, level set. Mahoney's fucking ready to go. I'm Start of the new month. How we feel in May. Come on. So let's go. State of the Union. The Cubs are 19 and 13. They're on pace for 96 wins. How's that sound? Sounds great, dude. Feeling fucking awesome. Yeah. Feeling fucking awesome. It's only going to get better. They're second place in the National League. Boo. Brewers are coming to town for three day games, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, all 120 starts. They're just one game back. They're fifth in the National League standings, two and a half off the Atlanta Braves. But I would also like to say the Atlanta Braves are also first in major league standings. So, ipso facto, the Cubs are just two and a half games away from being the best team in baseball, despite blowing four awful leads early in the season. I'll take uh, it. The run- yeah, take it. Take it. Leave it. We don't have a choice. This is just a good baseball team. Run differential, I like. Little early. They did lose 17 nothing Saturday. The run differential is plus 14. If they don't lose by 17 out of Saturday in Boston, uh, that's the third best run differential in the National League. But at the same time, if my grandma had balls, Tim, who would she be? Your grandpa. That's correct. She is not. She is my grandmother. Uh, playoffs, specific odds. Baseball reference, our friend says 90%. Fangraphs more conservatively, 60 Tim, where does the Monday Morning Cub show stand? I ran the calculations before the show. I'm prepped. It has 100% odds of us going to the playoffs. We're at 100%. Thank you. We we have a margin of error reserve there that's, uh, I believe, one-tenth of a percent should there be a catastrophic event, an act of God. But otherwise, this team's going to the playoffs. It, they're only going to get better. They have been awful, and yet... They are still very good. They are six and four over their last 10, and we're just going to do a quick look ahead. I'm going to go too far, but that's just the nature of the business, guys. Next nine games in 10 days. Okay. Three to open Shoot. the week in San Diego, or three at home against the Brewers. Three at home against San Diego. Off day Thursday, get on a plane, go to Pittsburgh, play the Pirates that weekend. Now, I don't want to look after that weekend, but I do have to mention to everybody that we have three games to start the next week in Atlanta where everybody's going to be jacked up for this Cubs team because things should be coming around these next nine games. That's where our head is at because we got some stuff to fix. We're banged up, bad play, no bullpen, surviving with four rookies in the lineup on any given day, relying on three rookies in the rotation while getting a combined slug under 350 from Nico Horner, Ian Happ, Dansby Swanson, while Cody Ballinger and Seiya Suzuki are on the injured list, all told those five guys are making over $100 million this year and are easily the five best guys on the roster. Because of that, I would like to circle back to the original point. The Cubs are 19 and 13 on pace for 96 wins. Everything I just said suggests that they should be getting significantly better at the best time of the season. Yeah. And let me just interject there. I had something I had mentioned, like thinking, what if you look at this lineup today as they had put it out, you know? where would they stand at the beginning of the season? Like if you looked at the lineup, uh, like guess their record instead of 19. And are you asking me if you pull, if you showed me today, May 2nd, the lineup card. Okay. Yes. Nico Horner at shortstop. So I don't know anything else. It's just May 2nd, Carl, here's the lineup. I see Nico yep. Horner at shortstop, Mike Talkman's in right field, Ian Happ left field hitting third, Christopher Morell at third base, Michael Bush at first base. 
Uh, wow. PCA and center. I would say that the team is probably 13 and 19. I would be wondering where Saya Ballinger and Swanson are at. I would be curious, like, is this Ben Brown's first start? Has he made a lot of starts? Like, what is he doing here so soon? I'd have so many, many fucking – Mike Talkman hitting second on purpose in right field. But, yeah, I don't want to deter from the show, but that was just something that, like, entered the mindset that I had to get off my chest because, like, you look at it and we shouldn't be where we are today, and that's why I'm grateful. I think that's the theme of this update. That's why it's urgent. It's necessary because we got to sound the alarm is that this team is special. There's magic. There's mojo in here. There's no way in baseball you get to 19 and 13 with the way that these guys have played. Making outs on the bases, they're horrendous in the the infield play. It's just been atrocious. So a lot of things that lose you baseball games consistently – is not getting in the way. In fact, the team just keeps winning dramatic games. They should have gotten swept by the Mets. Let's just start there. You have Edwin Diaz on Monday. You hit a home run off. You get beat on Tuesday. You need the replay call of the century on Wednesday, and you lose on getaway day. All close games, but realistically, they could have gone 0-4. We could be sitting here fucking complaining. Couldn't be happier about 2-2. Two and two. Dormant offense, horrible injuries. Um just everything, the big picture, if you look at it. And because we were looking at the big picture, you know, like I'm very happy with the two and two escape from New York, you know, Kurt Russell, you know, analogies <laughs> aside. Do you like escape from New York more or escape from LA or are you out on the franchise as a whole? I was more of an escape from LA guy The just, I, I didn't know about escape from New York until escape from LA came out. So that's really just a reference of age. It's a fair analogy. Escape from New York is a much better movie. And this is a much better series if you consider the entire season as a whole than if you just look at it as a four-game series. First, I would say the Mets are a disappointing team in the general conversation around baseball because they have Steve Cohen and they had last year, they had $86 million between Justin Verlander and Jacob DeGrom. They have an unlimited amount of money. Francisco Lindor is one of the highest paid shortstops, if not position players, AAV in baseball. Pete Alonso is... One of the best first six seasons in the history of the New York Mets. Jeff McNeil is a good baseball player. Brandon Nimmo, Starling Marte is talented. J.D. Martinez is not historically too shabby, although a horrendous double play candidate. Yeah. The bullpen's good enough, and they've gotten good starting pitching. So a lot of this is just high-level reflections on the Mets series to say. We're 2-2. Two and two. Yeah, like, they're not shitty. It could have gone the other way. If you ask a Mets fan, they'll tell you that the Mets stink. But the reality is they're not horrible. And it's just, that's I think, more of a testament to what's happening right now with this Cubs team is the fact that we're getting it done one way or the other. And I know that there's holes that we can poke from the series and the bullpen, um, but we're winning. And now we're finally going to get to some divisional games, which... I'm shocked the fact that we haven't pay, played any to this point in the season. Yeah, it's another scheduling beef. I think it has to do with like marketability because when the Cubs come to town or when you see that you're playing the Cubs on the calendar is a good way to generate interest from like non-casual fans. So it's just early in the season to sound the alarm like, oh, Mariners versus Cubs, Diamondbacks versus Cubs, Dodgers versus Cubs. So you kind of get that more, more general buzz going. The diehards are always going to show up for – the Pirates versus the Cubs in April, but how do you get the casual baseball fan? I still don't know how that settles with me as a diehard baseball fan because I, I do have issues with the scheduling. I do think there's ways to make the league better. But, you know, a unique thing with the Cubs, they have 28 games this season at Wrigley Field on Friday and Saturday. 26 of them will be played at 120. Three of those happen this weekend against the Brewers. So uh, that is a competitive advantage for the Cubs. I would agree. Day games at Kai Brigham. Yeah, because it's so lopsided. Right. And um, the fact that we're starting tomorrow against the Brewers, like, it has a good feel to it. I don't know. It's There's just something in my yeah. gut that, like, are we getting our bad baseball out of the way right now, or are we getting our bad, like, injury bug and shit out of the way? Excuse me. So, uh Slight negative feeling that I have lurking in my gut is that it's bad baseball, but
but there's still going to be that stretch of like, oh, well, that's bad luck. Like they haven't had bad luck. They've had tremendous luck. Right. Had, Insane. They're so lucky to be 19 and 13 because sure, Christopher Morrell hit that homer off Edwin Diaz, but like, are you really going to rely on the fact that Edwin Diaz is going to serve up a meatball two seam slider and a three one count? Exactly Doesn't happen. Morrell's looking for it. Are we really going to ask Showtime and Aga to throw seven scoreless innings every single time he takes them out on the road? You know, are we really going to ask Jamison Tayon to go pitch for pitch with a guy throwing a no hitter? Unbelievable. This is it's unreasonable. Like, this is stuff where when you look back in the end of the season, you'd say, man, Jamison Tyon threw an unbelievable start that one day against the Mets. And then it just so happens that the guy in the Mets took a no hitter into the seventh against the Cubs. Like, that's where the luck happens that these outcomes are being matched against each other and the Cubs are narrowly getting the edge more often than they're not so far. And that's really, too, dude, something that I've been thinking about. Like, that's the type of baseball that needs to be played, like, in, like, you know, the bounces that we need as fans, I suppose, that pay off in the long run, right? Like, the little win here and there, the f- freaking Pete Alonzo slide last night, like, insane the fact that they didn't call i don't know i honestly i'm I'm asked backwards with the whole thing but it just the fact that we're getting these bounces is exactly the type of things that you need early in the season so we're not looking back at you know uh say a suzuki drop fly ball later in the year and i feel really really good with where we're at dude i know that that's like a little bit all over the place but that's how i feel and like Justin Steele get a rehab start. Like I still am optimistic with how we're moving forward with what we have today. Sorry for long winded. I mean, I think it's exactly why I want to do the show with you. And I think it's a perfect touching point for why we're doing this specific show. I mean, why I want to do a cub show with you high level, but then also specifically why we're doing the urgent necessary podcast drop. Yeah, man. Because I think what you just said is perfectly encapsulates the collective feeling of Cubs fans because everybody's heads all over the place. People are talking about just trading for Mason Miller from the Oakland athletics. And we got to get the, pull the trigger. Now Steele's going to come back. He's an A. Showtime's going to win the Cy Young. Ballinger's going to come back to MVP levels. You know, like it's people are all over the place. People, I got David Kaplan saying Dansby Swanson's head's not in the game. His head's up his butt cheeks on Wednesday morning, you know, because not I, I want to I, I think I, that's like people are being. Crazy. I want to get to that. I do want to get to that a little bit down <sighs> in the show here. And okay, um, wrapping up the Mets series, I feel good about two and two. We will. I kind of want to take a look now at what's coming to town with the Brewers. I mean, massive storyline. Obviously, Council leaving his former coach at Notre mm-hmm. Dame who turned into, you know, right-hand man is now at the helm. The, the storylines are so deep and we can do a whole episode on that, but I want to yeah. just do really a quick preview of what the Brewers are going to be coming to town with. And first and foremost, for the folks that are going to be joining the game, I, I'll give you just a quick weather report. I, I did a little bit of research. Well, I'm not no, a meteorologist. I'm not, you're jumping the fucking gun on this weather report because the weather report plays – no, I, I sense the weather report is lurking. If you sandbag me with the weather report before I get a chance to talk about Pat Murphy, we're canceled the show. Mahomes. Let's is switch weather report. Switching gears now. We're going to backtrack a bit. <laughs> There's a tornado coming to town, and his name's Pat Murphy, and he has yes. a lot to do with Craig Council's background. Carl, tell me a little bit about what you know about Pat Murphy and, and what he brings to the table as a manager and, and how everything kind of flows into this weekend. Yes, I have a ton to say about Pat Murphy, Craig Council, but I want to narrow it to the really important parts because it's juicy shit, dude. Like, there's plenty of reasons to be interested in Cubs versus Brewers yeah. matchups. I have some stuff on the starting pitching. For the Cubs, really, our look ahead is just the lineup is going to be matched to the starting pitching. You're going to see more aggressive play. We'll get to that a little bit. Don't expect anything different. Don't expect the bats to get super hot. Don't expect them to be hanging eight runs. Like these should be nasty, ugly baseball games. Is my interpretation of the general play. Okay. Most most interesting though is Pat Murphy in an MLB dugout. Pat Murphy's the manager for the Brewers, and I'm going to sound excited and passionate about this because Pat Murphy is a legend in my generation for baseball at all levels. He ran Arizona State's program when Arizona State 
coming out of the Barry Bonds era into like the, when they had Dustin Pedroia and Ian Tinsler and they were just pumping first round pick after first. they were a juggernaut, probably the best program in college baseball, top three. And Pat Murphy was behind it. And you're right in saying he did take Notre Dame, the college world series. He was there with council. Notre Dame is like a great stepping program for guys to go to like huge jobs. And that's exactly what huge Murphy prick did, but there too. Dude, he is a legendary, like, do not fuck with Pat Murphy. He's the coolest guy. He's the coolest baseball guy. He thought Council hated him, and it was shocked that they were together beyond, but continue. Wait, he's just, you. if you look at the guy, his head's gigantic. He's built like a leprechaun, like a a full, (laughs) like a grown leprechaun. He's a scary-looking dude. He's a whisperer for baseball players. He is so good and so elite. And now this is going to sound crazy at making his guys feel like the best. If you play for a Pat Murphy team, you are showing up to the field, cock of the walk, the uniforms tucked in, not because Pat Murphy is a uniform guru, because that's part of the culture, baby. Yeah. Well, when you're stepping on the field, buddy, I want bounce. I want hop. You're in my program. We're out to beat the shit out of these guys. Don't you fucking worry about those guys. Don't you worry about that other pitcher. You worry about you. You worry about me. You're the best. We got this shit. Fuck those cocksuckers. Fuck the umpire. Everybody's out to get. If Mike Talkman was a manager, he would be Pat Murphy. If Mike Talkman had like charisma and was in front of the camera willing to say like, fuck you. Yes. And so counsel is the complete opposite of that. Murphy is still a genius. People have been dying to get him in an MLB dugout. This is his first time as like a full legit manager. He did an interim stint, I believe, before. But he's worked in front offices, player development, since he got forced out of Arizona State for whatever you want to say it was. College is college, right? College college bullshit. He's such a pro guy that like he he got got run out of Arizona State. (laughs) That's unbelievable. Um, the one thing, and I like read an article, you know, like that's my thing. Like I read an article this week, and it was the fact that he was shocked that Council even like it respected him. He's like, I was such a dick to him, essentially. I think like, not quote for quote. I didn't know that he respected me, and Council credits him with ev- like a lot of who he is as a person, not just baseball stuff. So that very yeah, cool, no. very cool. Council is the baseball player every manager like doesn't want to play. Like you didn't recruit Craig Council. He showed up. He wanted to go to Notre Dame and get an education. You go and you recruit guys nationally to come into Notre Dame. Then you have fall ball practice and you can't get rid of Craig Council. He's a player that literally you just the, you look at his batting stance. He doesn't do anything spectacular. I guarantee you Murphy wrote him because he's just like, I want this guy to quit so I can play the big That's scholarship funny. guy who's the draft prospect. Council never went away his entire career. That's just the way he's played into the game. It's a testament to how in tune he is with the game. But I I bet that would be the core of the relationship. And the last thing I want to say about this, because if it sounds like I'm going long on this, we'll talk more about the gameplay. But this is really interesting because Pat Murphy is obviously replacing Council. This is the first time the teams are meeting. There was already bad blood before Council was there. So there's some hangover from the veterans in the clubhouse that probably feel like they got gypped. They're playing extra hard for uh, fucking uh, Murphy now, and they've outperformed yeah, you know their game ahead for of the sure. Time. So there's some like really good storylines here. And again, it goes back to like these guys have been old sailors thirty something years. Just how long these two have known each other. Now they get to meet each other. So when the Cubs play the Brewers, I do think it's going to take on. Even though it's been a great rivalry, I think we're going to see at the start of this weekend a new chapter that's like could potentially be more chipper. Or more chippy and more more bitter and ferocious. I'm very interested, to really, to see how this thing takes shape. And the rivalry is already there. It's now only just you know going to get fed you know some more heat. Um, with the weekend preview, something that I've always appreciated really out of you is 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 you know I don't want to call it crazy, but like the fact how you get so deep into who the origin stories, if you will, of starting pitchers. And I want to just rifle through the starters coming to town this weekend. Tell me what you want to know about them and what we should know about them as, you know, maybe competitors or just this, that, or the other. Yeah. I mean, I think an interesting thing, it's like, it's not like I'm giving a scouting report to anyone who is going to be facing the starting pitchers. So like you do calls. I love starting pitcher origin stories because I think you can, 
predict and understand so much about where these guys can go if you are familiar with what where they came from and how they're equipped. I think you can learn a lot about the metal side or you can take pretty safe assumptions at a high level. It's just like color in the context, fill in the map out of play, yeah, get a better feel for, sure. for who they are and stuff. And so the origin story stuff I think is important. Like Joe Ross, for instance, is gonna pitch Friday for the Milwaukee Brewers. He's been atrocious this season. He's always been considered a top prospect coming up with the Washington Nationals, I believe is where he started. He finds himself in Milwaukee, like trying to find his stuff. And he's a classic traditional power pitcher. Now, interesting enough, his brother Tyson, who's my age, played in the big leagues for a number of years. Now he works in player development with the Dodgers. And Joe Ross is is maybe like an overthinker on the mound, probably has has too much too much structure in his head of how it should be and how it should go. His dad's a pediatrician. The mom works in an emergency room nurse out, I believe, Oakland, North Bay area. So like okay, a, yeah. Maybe not They're a serious family. part of town, but yeah, it's just a they serious got family. They medicine involved. Plays basketball. Correct. They have jobs Correct. that they so wake like, up and they meet. That means like some serious shit. I wake up and have to make phone calls. As that pertains to baseball, that, that background to me, I think it's, I think it's, right for for feeding i think we just absolutely tear this guy apart on friday like i know i didn't say that i said the cubs wouldn't score eight nine runs but if they're going to get to somebody this weekend i think they get to joe ross he's just he's trying to figure it out he's at that point in his career where like he he wants to hang on and, and get something out of the fact that he does have enough talent to be in the big leagues he hasn't really yet injuries bouncing around milwaukee's a good place to find yourself as a pitcher so i i don't think though he has found himself and i do think the element being in Wrigley Field for a day game while the Brewers are overperforming is is too much for him right now. So that's the first thing. The second guy on Saturday is Tobias Myers. Not a lot to talk about this guy. He's like undersized righty, 25 years old, high school draft pick. Yeah, I know zero Florida. about him. No one knows anything because this is his first taste of the big leagues. Okay. Cold Turk, my hands are up. My eyes are up if you're watching this on YouTube. I'm just going to recall this off the top of my head to the best of my ability. Tobias Myers is going to pitch at Wrigley Field on Saturday. He got drafted. It's awesome. He's 25 years old. He got drafted in 2016 by the Baltimore Orioles in the sixth round out of high school. The next year, they traded into the Tampa Bay Rays for Tim Beckham, who went first overall in 2009, I think. So, yeah, Tobias Myers, after years with the Baltimore Orioles, they trade him. I'm sorry. He's with the Orioles. They trade him to the Rays. He's with the Rays for a little bit. They trade him to the Guardians. The Guardians then sell him to the Giants. The Giants then DFA him. He goes to waivers. He gets claimed by the White Sox, who then get release him this winter, ultimately signs with the Milwaukee Brewers, and now he's like making major league starts. So I don't know how many teams. And he's just 25 he's years old. Seven. 25 years old, and he's been through that rigmarole. And now think of like a college kid that's going to get drafted up and who's like 26 years old and someone in the clubhouse is like, yeah, it's a business. Like, wait till you find out it's a business. Like this poor kid was like 18 years old. All right. Now you're going to go to Tampa. Okay. Now you're 20 years old. Nobody wants you. That's a lot, man. He wasn't getting traded for anyone significant. He wasn't part of any big deals. He was just. Just a piece and a cog in the system. But now he's getting starts in the bigs at least. Yeah. It was like the Tim Beckham deal was like a reclamation project. You know, the Orioles willing to take a flyer on Tim Beckham. And ever since then, it's just been trying to find a home. That home is with the Milwaukee Brewers, and it brings him to Wrigley Field on Saturday at 120. And then finally, the last guy is just is Bryce or Brees. I can't pronounce it because it's it's one of those hillbilly names, B-R-Y-S-E. But it might be both ways, so don't even worry about that. <laughs> He's 6'2", 300 pounds, so you don't see that very often in the big leagues, obviously. Um I thought you said 300 earlier. I was like, whoa. No, I did say he's 6'2", 300. He's 300 pounds? He's listed at 275, and nobody lists themselves. Nobody at 260 is listing 270. Once you get to the 275 list range, you are in the three-bill territory. Okay, wow. Yeah, this is not football. If you're if you're a baseball player and you are six foot two and you are listing yourself at two seventy five, I'll absolutely guarantee there's three bills on that scale. Now, interesting, Bryce Wilson as he takes the mound as a competitor, he came up as a starter with the Braves. They had traded him around. He ends up with the Pirates. The Pirates trade him back to. I, he somehow ends up with the Brewers last year. 
where Council converted him to the bullpen. He made 53 appearances last year, pitched like a 2-6 ERA. So he gets drafted out of this North Carolina high school where in North Carolina he was the state high school player of the year for baseball and football. Okay. So he's a dog. Signed, signed for like 1.2, 1.5 million out of the fourth round for the Braves. Braves don't typically pay over slot. They don't typically do – like that's – the other guys the Braves have done that with are like Max Freed and Spencer Strider – so he's within this Braves development system. It doesn't okay. matter. He doesn't really pan out. He does have that high end stuff though. Ends up with the Brewers. So they're finally making him like making him put him into the rotation. He he this is long winded and I, I just but I did my research and I want to share it so that Yeah, we I love it. Days. Please, I appreciate it. And so does the audience. He doesn't he doesn't stri- thank you. He does seriously, thank you. Because I like feel like such a weirdo as I I like this off. shit. And that's why I'm asking. He doesn't stri- he doesn't strike out that many. He strikes out below ma- major league average. He walks people above major league average. He gives hits up above major league average. He gives up an average amount of home runs. So you're like, what is special about this guy? He doesn't give up any other extra base hits. So okay. all his damage is single home run. So those doubles. They don't come in bunches. There's usually like a runner on base, a walk, a base hit, or something like that. I think that's the type of guy that the Cubs are going to fucking murder because he introduces threats on the bases but limits the extra base hit. It's like nobody on the Cubs is getting in the box trying to hit an extra base hit. So if we get into a rubber match 1-1, I think the Cubs should be huge favorites on We're Sunday against this guy. Take the at-bats, get on base, and then maybe drill one and put us up big. However, if the Cubs win the first two games of the series, this is the type of guy who comes out and shoves it up your ass on a Sunday. This is a this is a country boy. In circumstances, mean a lot to this type of background on the mound. So one one game, I need to go pitch a good game. I need to give us some backup against the wall. I got it. But if you put him in a situation where he's trying to be too fine. Hey, go win the series. I think the Cubs smash him. I think if it's an opportunity to say, don't get swept, I think he goes out and he pitches a hell of a game, which is a really nuanced fucking take. But deep down in my instinct, like that's how I feel about this type of guy. But so those are that's what I want to hear. Brewers. Thank you. That's what I want to hear too, is really what your instincts feel. I do feel Colin, like going into the series that we should take two of three. Um, I think the bats are going to wake up a little bit, but that's just, you know, my gut feeling for those going to the ballpark, just a quick what, weather report. Yeah, and we're going to move I, on. I, I want to tee you up for the weather. I've been dying cool. to tee you up. I got mad earlier because you started, you jumped weather. You're jumping. I, like, it's like, I'm about I to get excited. My, it's you're the weather guy. Like uh, the amount of times you're talking about weather, when we sit on a golf course, you'll be like, Hey, I don't know if you guys heard about the nimbulus is setting in. You'll be talking about the horizon. You have five different weather apps on your phone. This is something we've casually talked about before where it's like, you know what? I wouldn't hate it. If you started doing daily weather reports for Wrigley Field on your Twitter, you told me I'm going to get to it. We've gone back and forth. I, the weather report from Mahoney is going to be above and beyond what you think a weather report. I'm not, a, I'm not, it's fair. I'm not a chief or professional meteorologist. I want to get that out of the way. If you're going to be heading to the ballpark this weekend for the first divisional series, there's going to be a chance of showers tomorrow a bit early. Don't worry about it. Don't sweat it. It's going to move through the Chicagoland area relatively probably before 11 a.m. And you're going to get some clear, partially cloudy skies throughout the ball game. The wind isn't going to play a factor. Saturday, beautiful day. Now, if you're going Saturday with the family, this is the day to do it. Also, wind, not going to be a big of an issue. We might have eight miles an hour out of the east. No ifs, ands, or buts there. You're going to get about 72 degrees with 80% humidity. I will say now, Sunday, get ready. Carl, you're blowing the clouds. Beautiful. We're going to have a jet stream coming in from the north, and Sunday is going to bring in some cold masses of air, and they're going to flow right through Wrigley Field, ladies and gentlemen. And no. not only with that cold mass of air, the winds are going to be picking up. We're not just going to be seeing swirls. We're going to be seeing winds going out. So look for the bat to affect the ball quite a bit once it pops it in the air. I got a little yep. lost in my words there, but I think, you know, once that fucking ball is in the air, anything's going to happen. So 
take that in consideration, pack yourself a hoodie, but enjoy the ballpark. You're going to be all right. We're not going to see any rainouts this weekend. Your insatiable need to remind me that you got stumbled in your words there while you were getting stumbled in your words is what makes you Mahoney and why I love you so dearly. How uh, many sales report- presentations I do that to, it's it's beyond. No one knows anything's going wrong, but I always remind them. It's like you're halfway through a pitch for orbits. Like you haven't worked at orbits in six months, buddy. <laughs> like <Yeah>. you- <laughs> This is a software implementation. This is an open enrollment meeting for life insurance, dude. You're over here talking about fucking travel discounts and vouchers. I'll be I'll be honest with you about the weather report here. Sunday has my ears perked a little bit. Friday, the downer, I don't like because they travel. I would like them to wake up to the sun beating into their like bedroom windows in Lakeview or wherever these guys live, West Loop. It's not happening. Yeah, it's not. I would like them to get out. Go walk the dog, feel good, get that buzz from Chicago, like some pride before they go to Wrigley Field. Like, yo, this is what we're, you know, this is what we're playing for. Still a possibility. It's going to be light sprinkles, so this isn't thunderstorms. Hey, I'm satisfied with the review we did of the Mets in the in the preview that we had with the Brewers. As far as we level set, obviously we want to sweep. I think two and one is the goal, right? One and two feels bad. Two and one feels good. And so this is like. There ain't no way they go one and two and we're going to sit down on Monday and have a good spin on it because the way the bullpen's been coming, so let's just narrow in on a couple of like key issues that I think are important. Yeah, yep. We keep it under 30 minutes. Let's just pivot, say, keep it under 40. We are we want to have this tight, urgent, necessary show out. There's a couple things left here. The first thing I want to talk about, Mahoney, I'll let you pick. I tweeted out earlier, and I'm a man of my word, but if Shota Imanaga does win the Cy Young, I am getting the symbol, the Japanese letter or symbol for left-handed pitcher done one way or the other. That's how much I love that guy. And then you had also co-signed. Yeah, no, I did co-sign on this. So there's a, this is a tattoo bat. You didn't have to do that either. I just sent out. I, it's I called want character, this to by the way. You called it a symbol. It's a character. Okay. So, just, so we're. Well, I mean, hey, we're going to go back to Osaka, and you're going to have to do some. You're going to be accepting a key from. I need to know. Treasurer of Osaka for your tourism boost, and you'll be saying, "Hey, look at my tattoo of the symbol." And should he know English, he might be offended. You didn't say character, so it's a character. understood. It, it also does not mean left-handed pitcher. It really doesn't even mean lefty either. It just means the direction left. So that's the tattoo I'm getting and I'm going to get it with you. I'm going to get it somewhere on my right arm. And then people are like, what's that mean? I'm going to say it means left. And then people are going to say, but that's on your right arm. I was like, gotcha. Conversation starter, dude. There you go. Exactly. Now we're hooked. Tell me who, who's your vendor on this search. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) Shota Imanaga is so good and has been sensational. The only thing we can do is take credit for predicting how good he is. That's that's honestly how I feel. We've talked about him at length on the Monday Morning Cup show. We'll talk about him at length again on Monday as we look ahead into his his next start, which should be at home against the San Diego Padres. He should eat them for fucking lunch. Let's go. It's gonna Let's be go. Standing. It's going to be outstanding. The only the only thing I would like to call from Shota, it's his quote. I can stand behind this on my own from observation. But he affirmed it in the media via translator, which we trust because the translator doesn't seem to be that friendly based on Sunday Night Broadcast. No, he does not like long-winded questions as far as I've seen. Good fill in there because I was catching my breath for this one. I mean, they're long-winded questions, and that's not fair to him either. So, I mean, chop it up a little bit. We can get in the broadcast too, Booth, that bother me. But I want (laughs) to focus here on Shota. He has already admitted and said to the media – they don't have data on me. They don't have video. They'll make adjustments. Yeah. And when they do, I will have to make my adjustments. He's ready. Is, I mean, that's a core crux piece of Major League Baseball. When a player gets in, you are who you are. You you play against what the league gets. And if you're good enough, the league is going to adjust to you. If you're not, you don't play. You go back down or you sit on the bench or you're just, you're never an impactful player. But a lot of players, you know, that are playing every day get to the point where then the league is going to make that adjustment against you. And then it's up to you to make that adjustment back against them. And then it's just a little cat mouse game. Shota isn't even close to where the league knows what's going on. 
every hitter that faces him or has talked about him publicly, the media talks about the deception, quick pitches, weird release point. The fastball is different than what you're comfortable with. He's got a weird split and he, and he changes arm angles and visuals. And so like, it's just a completely new look for guys. Japanese He's spin rates. That's why they signed him. But I, I'm compelled to just say like, if he's talking about the fact the league's going to adjust for him, don't be coming back here bitching in June because he, you know, had two back to back clunkers or something like. It's yeah. going to be part of the process, which is why it's all the more important that he's been great so far this season. So he yeah. pitches to get on money against the Padres. We'll be fucking ready for that start. Give me one more thing. How bad is the bullpen? I know that's like a hot button topic. <laughs> is it like horribly bad? Is it league average or is it, you know, you mentioned though? How bad is it? Is it bad? It's bad enough that I think we buried the lead. Okay. Fair. I think we fucked up. I think we fucked up that like we're just that we didn't open this up with. But I also do kind of want to build positivity and maintain positivity. And maybe we, this, we have a lot to talk a, about on Monday. Yeah. yeah, there's there's this there's a point though where you have to abandon positivity for like objective reality. And we're there with the bullpen now to just say like, it is, it's going to be our pain in the ass. We're gonna, it's a ship we're going down. It's fucking going to sink us. Like I already can smell it. If we don't change it now, this is it. There's nothing else we need to fit. There's no, Oh, if only we had a left-handed bat. If yeah, we, had a better, but- we have all the players for all the positions. I got five guys that can play fucking six different spots tomorrow. I got all these different lineup combinations in my head. What I don't know is who pitches the seventh, eighth, the ninth inning. Of close baseball games, and I don't know who does it confident. That's 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 the honest guy truth. Now, last last thing for you, um, would you be comfortable? I post this on Carl Case. Would you be comfortable at the start of every game to just say it's one nothing? Go to the bottom of the ninth. The Cubs are on the road every game for the rest of the season. Or would you rather just would you rather have them play zero zero and see how it goes? I'd rather start off one nothing. No, but... no, no, no. It's one nothing. Bottom nine, and we're oh. and that's it. I'd be a little bit worried right now. Or would you rather start a game zero zero and play nine innings, or would you rather just be bottom ninth, one nothing every game for the rest of the game, rest of the season? I'd rather start zero zero. I don't know. I'm in a pretzel. That's what a lot of people said sincerely. I thought I would get a lot of one nothings because my point in saying that was like, hey, the boatman's bad, but the odds are in our favor. It's like shooting free throws. Yeah, you know, like p- power forwards on the line, front end of a one on one. Like, okay, so he shoots seventy four percent. Like he's got this. Like, I, I don't have reason to think, like, of course he's going to miss. It's not shout out, uh, fucking Ben. God, what was his name on the Bulls? Ben Brown? No. Ben from, Gordon? Uh, for, no, for, he didn't miss free throws from the Pistons. Ben Wallace. Ben Wallace. Jesus. Yes, I knew that. He was like 39% with the Pistons one year, I think. Anyways, my point is shout out Ben Wallace. I can't believe the Bulls made him take the. Take the headband off. The I know. Trash so weird. Or, uh, classless organization, but just go, <laughs> going back to the Cubs, I think I think the bullpen is such an obvious issue that you're going to see drastic action taken. That's the type of thing. How about this? We talked early with Tom Ricketts insert himself into decisions for the Cubs. Has this not. Is, this is one of the rare in season things where Tom might walk into an office and go, got a minute. Yeah. We, we got to do something about bullpen. Cause I don't like the branding that we're getting. I don't, the fans aren't reacting with well, this is starting to become bigger. So what do you have in mind? Or at least start the conversation say, what's our gate plan? Tell me, walk me through what you have in mind to solve this. I want to reinforce. You can do whatever you want. We have the budget. It's like, that's kind of the Tom Ricketts ownership. Right. squeaky so, wheel like if anything like hey just so you know so i do think that's a benefit for the kids who it's better than him going in and saying we need to make a move now or, or it's better than him being completely hands off i think he's somewhere in the middle ground so shout out to tom ricketts we're a very pro tom ricketts show here big tom ricketts um, show i had stuff prepared for dance me i i think i'm gonna take a breather on it because i was just mad kaplan said his head was in his butt cheeks on wednesday morning i think that's super unfair to dance me i think that's, that's a horrible way to paint a picture about who the cubs are i have a ton of respect for cap i think amazing huge friend huge friend to me and good to me i shouldn't say huge friend but off a friend to me in this space since i got into it and i have nothing but nice things to say about him professionally he carries a show he carries, he's been carrying shows for fucking decades in chicago 
still writes a column. He's fucking Naperville, whatever. He's a good dude. He's a legend too. I mean, like, yeah, we love Cap, all that. The and best. it's, but you'd be remiss not to say that you I have a different it. feeling. So we could, we could revisit that on Monday. I think that yeah. there's a lot to talk about. I think it's good. Dansby has a day off today. We'll see how things shake out this weekend. Um, but no, dude, perfect midweek, urgent, needed check-in, I believe. Yeah, absolutely. I hope people are prepared and ready for this Brewer series. Sure, it take the lead in the playoffs, and you know we want to get ahead and put them down, whatever. But it's it's the first first tasted division battle, and our division has outperformed itself on paper. The Brewers are at the top of it. There's a lot of juicy reasons. Craig Council managed against his team that handed us our lunch for the last you know half decade in the division plus. So as far as the outside sensational stuff that really piqued the emotions is the customer. Ooh, this is juicy. This sounds fucking good. It's right here. It's right yeah. now. It's this, it's this moment. It's we're getting ready for Fred. We played bad. We're going to get better injured list. So we'll be back on Monday with more details, specifics. I have some real heavy stuff I want to get on Dan V. Swanson. Maybe, maybe a follow-up video. Individual just sit here and break it down. Like, yeah, really dude. fundamentally break it down. Give it to us. Yeah, we haven't even hit the dog days yet, <laughs> boys and girls. So thanks for tuning in. We'll see you on Monday morning. Po- yeah, post show, I've got a Celsius carbonated beverage addiction. So if you guys, that's a joke. That's We're going to talk to you I off. Want to I want to yeah. talk to you off camera about that. Seriously, though, this stuff is like, lift it. All right, last call to action. Subscribe, subscribe. You guys don't have to. We'll be back on Monday. Everybody thank Mahoney. Go follow Mahoney. A thousand followers. Hey, speaking of the thousandth follower, Justin Steele from the Chicago Cubs. Thank you, sir. He also sent me a very nice message this morning saying, hey, he watched the he watched the numbers turn. That's something like I'm burying that. Like, hey, Justin Steele messaged me when I woke up today, and it's the last thing I talk about on the show. But hey, yeah, thank yeah. you. I'm well, when you that in. when you're at a thousand two, you know you're yeah, going to be fir- flirting. I go down to ninety seven, go up above a thousand. So I went back down to nine ninety seven. He was the a thousandth, and then I sent him a gift that I don't know if is going to resonate because he might be too young. It was a stringer bell from the wire. You know, let everybody know that we back up. And I don't know if he might have like knew about that or not, Justin. If not, check out the wire. See you guys on Monday. See you guys on Monday. Yeah. <laughs> All right.